Components Research in the Technology Development Department of Intel Corporation. Today, I will present on enabling hybrid bonding on Intel process. Here is an outline of the talk. First, I'll start with a brief overview of the need for pitch scaling and how hybrid bonding can enable that. I will also provide a brief overview of the technology. Afterwards, I will discuss some of the design benefits and considerations of hybrid bonding for digital and RF circuits. Next, I will discuss some of the process and assembly optimizations uh, to minimize the defects and ensure high quality final bonding. And finally, I will share the manufacturing results for our test trips and discuss some of the future considerations, then conclude my talk. So starting with the motivation and process overview. The current packaging trends include enabling more functionality in the package, for example, by increasing the in-package memory or enabling more processing cores. This requires a shift from monolithic die architectures, as you see in the left figure, through 2D architectures in the middle, for example, such as multi-chip packaging or Intel EMA, all the way to 3D integration architectures, uh, as you see on the right, for example, through silicon interposers and Intel Omnidirectional Interconnect or ODI. Um, so there is a need for heterogeneous integration technology that enables um, combining multiple dies, which can be optimized for different functionalities, uh, for example, processing, memory, power delivery, and so on. Uh, all of that while maintaining near monolithic performance, which in other words mean that we have minimal overhead in terms of interconnect area, circuit power, and latency. Unfortunately, the current incumbent technology, which is solder, um, has limited interconnect density, which results in relatively high uh, overheads. So the graph on the right shows the normalized interconnect area on the vertical axis versus the interconnect pitch on the horizontal axis. As you see from the figure, in order to reduce the interconnect area, which is associated with this uh, overhead, uh, there is a need to reduce the interconnect pitch. And that, as I mentioned, uh, solder has a limitations on scaling the pitch below 10 microns uh, due to some electrical and thermomechanical considerations. This is an issue that we discussed in a previous publication. So in order to extend the pitch to sub 10 microns, we need a new assembly technology and the current leading assembly technology for that is hybrid bonding, which was shown to support pitch down to sub one micron pitch. So before I discuss some of the technology details, I would like to highlight some of the benefits of hybrid bonding. Hybrid bonding enables us to have interconnect densities that are comparable to on die via densities. So we're able to get more than 10 times higher density than solder, which reduces this area overhead. The smaller parasitics and the higher density enables up to five times lower capacitance uh, for a stack die, as you see in the top, uh, in the top figure which translates to lower power and latency. Uh, furthermore, for the side-to-side -side connections when placing uh, dies side-by-side, -side, we can get much better signal integrity, which translates to much simpler circuits. Uh, this is, as you see in the bottom uh, figure. And again, the high density enables us to have a significantly improved overhead and helps us achieve this near monolithic performance that we aspire towards in future heterogeneous integration technologies. And there are more details uh, on these figures available at the reference below. Here's a brief comparison of solder attached versus hybrid bonding. We discussed that in more details in our other publications, but I want to draw your attention to a few features. Solder attached requires protruding copper pillars that are capped with solder material. This generally results in density electromigration challenges and impacts on the thermomechanical performance of the final structure. Hybrid bonding effectively removes this interface between the two dyes and removes many of these problems. However, it comes with its own set of challenges, such as complex process and extremely clean assembly, as well as some test challenges. And I will discuss some of these challenges in this presentation. So there are generally two types of hybrid bonding assembly, wafer to wafer and die to wafer. In the wafer to wafer case, the two wafers are manufactured, bonded, then the stack dies are diced and tested. This generally is more mature and is currently uh, finer pitch 
but has several limitations that limit its widespread use. For example, the two dyes need to be the same size, and there are some cumulative yield impacts since both dyes have to work uh, for, the full full, for the full stack to work. The preferred version for high performance computing is dyed wafer, as you see on the right figure, where the dyes on each wafer are tested, then the good dyes are diced from one wafer and attached to the good dyes on the base wafer. This is currently less mature, but is improving rapidly and addresses the limitations uh, of the wafer to wafer bonding. This is also the focus of this presentation. Here's an outline for this section of the talk. Hybrid bonding or HBI is a new bonding technology. So we need to have a holistic view on the design, process and assembly interactions. Uh, this is particularly important because we need to ensure that we optimize the overall performance. Afterwards, we need to verify these selections uh, through test chip design and manufacturing. First, I will start with the design challenges and impacts on power and signal integrity. Let's start by looking at the changes in the interconnect parasitics. On the left figure, you see a silicon interposer package using solder with several dyes on top. In current technologies, these dyes connect to the interposers through solder. If we zoom in at this interface, you can see that the solder connections and what happens when they're converted to hybrid bonds or HBI. First, their area becomes much smaller and the distance between the two dyes is now much shorter. Both of these result in much better resistance and capacitance for HBI pads compared to solder microbumps. This is shown in the right figure. However, this is not the whole picture. We need to take into account the total parasitics, including the circuits, the drivers, the routing, uh, and so on. Again, the reference below has more details on this topic. Another important design consideration that we found is related to the on-die high-quality factor inductors and transformers. These are used often for high-speed circuits such as DDR and PCI Express, as well as RF devices. If you look at the field distribution around an inductor, as shown in the top left figure, um, you will see that it extends away from the die surface. In the case of solder connections, there is enough space between the top and bottom dies to avoid significant impacts on the performance of these inductors. However, when we switch to hybrid bonding, the fields would now extend into both dies, which impacts the inductor quality factor, as you see in the middle figure, whereas the horizontal axis is the frequency and the vertical axis is the quality factor. What we found is that by implementing design rule changes on both the top and bottom dies, and removing some of the hybrid bonding pads around the inductors, we're able to effectively eliminate the impact on the quality factors, as you see on the right figures. And in the bottom figure, you can see how removing the pads around the inductors help reduce the eddy currents in these pads and help us improve the quality factor. However, we need to balance this requirement with the processing requirements such as surface topography after polishing. And there are a few other considerations to take into account that were discussed in the paper. For example, there are current crowding effects that require proper pad design. Also due to the smaller spacing and the stronger mechanical coupling between the two dies, there are some thermomechanical benefits that can also be achieved. Next, I will discuss some of the process optimization considerations and some of the results. So for background, here is a simplified overview of the process steps. We build the dies up to the topmost metal layers, as you see on the left. Afterwards, we add the via layer and then the hybrid bonding pad layers, as you see on the right. There are some design rule changes that are needed to support the smaller pitch and improve the electrical performance and density. One of the immediate issues that we saw is that the bonding layers are relatively thick metal layers. This results in significantly higher wafer bow that prevents continued processing. What we found is that by optimizing the stack materials and the deposition parameters, we were able to control the bow in order to make it acceptable for continued processing 
as you see on the right figure. The other critical process step is the planarization step through chemical mechanical polishing or CMP. In general, there are two considerations, the dielectric surface topography around the pad. Ideally, we need the dielectric surface to be as flat as possible in order to maximize the initial bonding strength. The other parameter is the surface roughness. We need the surface of the dielectric to be as smooth as possible, again, to maximize the contact area. The dielectric, we need the metal pads to be recessed by a certain amount below the dielectric surface so that the metal pads can expand and form the contact during the anneal. With standard CMP, we weren't able to achieve the surface planarity we need, as you see in the, right, uh, in the top right figure which shows the surface profile measured through atomic force microscopy. However, after process optimizations, we were able to achieve very good planarity and very well controlled metal pads recess. We were also able to achieve very smooth dielectric surface, which enables us to have very good initial dielectric bonding. Next, I'll discuss some of the assembly considerations. There are three major assembly considerations, the placement accuracy, the extreme cleanliness, and test. The first item to consider is placement accuracy and throughput. We need to support extremely fine pitch, so we need to be able to place the dies very accurately. This is achieved through design optimizations to make sure that the alignment fiducias have very good visibility and contrast while not consuming too much of the die active area. Also, tool optimizations were done to ensure fast throughput while maintaining good alignment. Through this approach, we are able to achieve very high alignment accuracies that enable scaling hybrid bonding significantly below 10 micron pitch. One of the major fail modes of hybrid bonding is particles or surface defects. As you see in the left figure, if we have a small particle and we try to bond the two dies, a very large void gets formed around the defect area since the dielectrics cannot get close enough to attract each other and form a bond. This is particularly problematic as we go to smaller and smaller pitch, as you see in the right figure. The horizontal axis is the pitch and the vertical axis is the number of failed connections. The color represents a particle size. As you see, even for a 100 nanometer particle, we can have hundreds of field connections below 10 micron pitch. So it is extremely important to keep the surfaces of the dyes and the wafers extremely clean and free of defects. We did several rounds of process optimizations to ensure extreme cleanliness and avoid particles which can cause bond failures. This includes switching to class 100 assembly floor cleaning and surface protection of the dyes and wafers, as well as several tool optimizations. This results in significant reduction in the particle counts, as you see in the right figure. The top figure shows the reduction in the particle count, and the bottom figure shows the particle locations on the wafer before and after optimization. Testing is another challenge for hybrid bonding due to all the cleanliness and surface protection required. However, one of the important items that I want to touch on is the test coverage. When we go to hybrid bonding, we have the opportunity to form a system that has many dyes. As you see on the, right, on the left figure, some of the dyes may have manufacturing defects that would ideally be screened out during test. However, if the test coverage is not 100%, some of these dyes may pass as good dyes. This is a particular challenge since this defect, defective dye may result in lower final system yield, especially as the number of dyes increase. This is shown in the right figure where the horizontal axis is the total number of dyes and the vertical axis is the final system yield. As you see in the plot, the test coverage must be very high in order to ensure good final system yield for systems that contain large number of dyes. So after these different optimizations, we need to verify the full flow through test strips. Here is a photo of our passive test strip. 
This uses Intel's latest backend process. It contains daisy chains for continuity and resistance checks. The left part of the figure shows the base die with the attached locations where one or two top dies may be attached. The bottom figure shows a zoom in over the pad area. We had several dimensions of the pads to test the process capability. This is just one of the examples. And the bottom left figure shows the CMP results after process optimizations, where you can see very flat and smooth dielectric surface. The other test chip we manufactured is an active test chip. It allows us to test the full flow from design to manufacturing to test. As you see in the figures, it consists of four top dies on a base die in an active interposer configuration. There are SRAM bags and high-speed circuits in all the dies. The bottom right figure shows the die layout where we are forming more than, more than 3 million connections between the top and bottom dies. This test chip is taped out and manufactured uh, and the bottom left figure shows an optical photo of the hybrid bonding pads and the optimized CMP process also works very well for this active design as you see in the surface height scan data on the bottom right figure. The test chips were manufactured and bonded. Here is a cross-section photo of one of the bonded dies. There are two main items that we look for to ensure good bonding. The first one is indistinguishable dielectric to dielectric transition at the bond interface. And the second one is that we want to see metal to metal interdiffusion at the interface, which ensures that we form proper metal to metal bond. We were able to get both of these in our test trip. Additionally, we also tested the electrical performance of the daisy chains and we were able to get good electrical results as you see in the right figure. Now I'll summarize what I shared with you today and conclude with some future considerations for hybrid bonding. So in this talk, I provided an overview of how hybrid bonding technology is enabled on Intel process. I discussed some of the power and signal integrity benefits and considerations. For example, how hybrid bonding enables much lower parasitics, but leads to increased coupling between the stack dies that require some design changes. I also showed some of the process challenges, such as achieving extremely flat dielectric surface with controlled meta recess, as well as some of the assembly challenges in order to maintain extremely clean surface and achieve good alignment. Both of them are extremely important to enable a scalable pitch. And finally, I shared with you our active and passive test strip structures, designs, and their manufacturing results. So I would like to conclude my talk with a few thoughts. In general, hybrid bonding or HPI enables near monolithic interconnect between different triplets. This is great for future compute architectures and further extends Moore's law. This also raises the need for extensions to current triplet ecosystems. Unlike solder, there are additional interoperability specifications that are needed for hybrid bonding, such as the pad dimensions, the surface roughness and planarity and so on. All of these specifications may be needed in order to enable triplets from different founders to be assembled to one another. And with that, thank you again for attending this talk and I'll be glad to answer your questions.